Good morning, afternoon, or evening. Welcoming you from wherever you are at this moment. I am Wendy McGeehan, Senior Director of General Management Business Acumen Open Enrollment Programs here at Wharton Executive Education. I'm happy to have so many of you join us as we take the time to explore a topic area that continues to be very, very relevant to so many people in so many different ways. But before we dive into our session this morning with Raghu, Neil, and Santiago, I want to address a few concert rules or guidelines to make your experience with us a success. We will be taking questions throughout the discussion, so please use the Q&A icon on the right side of the screen to post your questions. If you have technical issues, please use the moderator chat function, also on the right side of your screen, to submit your tech issues. And now, please let me have the honor to introduce to you the faculty with whom I work extensively with at Wharton Executive Education, who will be leading our discussion today. Raghu Iyengar, who I'm very happy to say is the Academic Director of Wharton Executive Education's Customer Analytics for Growth Using Machine Learning, AI, and Big Data Program, is the Myers-Busch Wharton 1885 Professor, Professor of Marketing. He is also the Faculty Director of Wharton Customer Analytics, or WCA, an internationally recognized initiative linking business and academia in all things related to customer analytics. Santiago Galino is an assistant professor of operations, information, and decision, and the co-academic of Wharton Executive Education's new designing and managing supply chains for the future. And last, but certainly not least, is Neil Hoyne. Neil is the chief measurement strategist at Google and a senior fellow at Wharton specializing in customer analytics. Raghu, the floor is yours. Thank you to Executive Education for putting this together. And finally, thank you to Santiago and Neil, uh, my co-conspirators, uh, just to kind of put, uh, you're already seeing us, but just to kind of uh, also put a picture to the face. Uh, that's Santiago, that's Neil, and that's myself. Uh, the three of us are very passionate about analytics. Um, Santiago's background is also in supply chain, so we'll talk about that as well. Neil, as you can see, he's the chief measurement strategist at Google. He's also a senior fellow at Wharton Customer Analytics, which is the center that uh, that Wendy was mentioning. So all of us are very excited about analytics, uh, but more importantly for the people who are joining us today, uh, I think you know you have to start questioning. I think the very important question is, what are the kinds of things that uh, businesses are prioritizing as they look forward You know, in the, in the current pandemic world, in the post-pandemic world, what are the kinds of issues that are bubbling up? We've kind of put together some issues, but by no means I think we want to stick to this particular deck per se. Uh, we would encourage you, as Venti said, to ask questions. Uh, you know, Neil, from his perspective, Santiago and myself, from our perspective, we would love to have a conversation as well. So I think, you know, just to get us get started, I think one of the issues that has been popping up quite a bit uh, is the, the following. Uh, on the one hand, you know, if you think about the, the pandemic and the post-pandemic world, clearly from a customer behavior perspective, things have changed. Uh, you can, you know, no matter which company, industry you're in, uh, obviously, you're thinking about the fact that, you know, what would customer behavior be like uh, when people start kind of going back to the pre-pandemic world, so to speak? How has it fundamentally shifted? What's the conundrum here? The conundrum, so to speak, is that on the one hand, uh, perhaps if your company was digital or was already going digital, you might be getting a lot of data coming in. On the other hand, uh, lots and lots of data that you may have had from the pre-pandemic world it might be hard to, in some sense, forecast. Why? Because that's where the idea of test and learn comes in. So let's think about what's happening here. You know, one way to think about it is, you know, what, you know, what's a good way of forecasting? One good way of forecasting is what are people searching for? So I went in, um, I looked at uh, the Google Trends, for example, and just to see, for example, what are some top yearly trending categories? Makes sense, you know, if you think about it, knees guards, household disinfectants, you know, clearly, I mean, there's a lot of face validity here. You can look at perhaps where is it trending? You can kind of get a sense of that. But at the end of the day, you know, if you start making decisions, uh, thinking about what people are searching for, would that be enough? Neil, what do you think? Uh, from your perspective, as you look at some of this data, what are some things that companies have been coming to you with uh, in terms of how to use it? What kinds of issues are bubbling up? Yeah, I, th I think it's a starting point, really, Raghu. I think that a lot of companies are saying what we're witnessing right now um, 
we don't necessarily have the tools, the techniques, the processes to adapt to. And when they look at their previous data, they look at their most valuable customers, uh, they look at their most uh -huh. valuable travelers, those customers in many cases are nowhere to be seen. Uh -huh. And so I think what they're trying to do is a lot of companies are just out there grasping and saying, what can we look at? How can we start to make sense of this? So it's almost to say companies, all the competencies that they've built are not necessarily helping them through the next stage. And so they're saying, well, what signals are available that we can start to use to understand and make sense of this? Um, and out of that too, just worth mentioning is just a moment of comfort. Uh, we do see a lot of companies where they come in and they say, we should have already solved this. Uh, we collected terabytes of data. There should be something in here that can help us. In most cases, not. Uh, and this actually goes to what I think you were pointing towards with, with the yeah. test and learn mention, is yeah. that companies now are looking uh, less at, at data solving the problem directly, more saying what are the processes surrounding the data that we yeah. can use to start investigating and learning about the problem. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. Because one of the things, again, um, I think just to summarize what Neil said, and I think this is a great point as well, which is at some point, you know, when you're looking at some of these forecasts, some of these trends, and I'm just taking trends as an example, of course, in each of your companies, you may have had your own CRM systems. Uh, you're kind of tracking people over time, perhaps, or looking at tracking your business volume over time. Yes, things are declining. And you don't need that to kind of, you know, in some sense, look at what's happening. You somehow have to have a way, exactly like Neil, what you said, business processes that will help to help you make a decision about what will happen in the market going forward. So that's where this idea of test and learn comes in. And I think the fundamental tension is, so to speak, the following. On the one hand, you know, you may have a lot of data coming in now. Um, you know, if you're a company which is, which, as I was saying earlier, more digital, or perhaps had taken the right steps to become more digital in anticipation of what might happen. A lot more digital data, but what's the problem? Just like what Neil was saying. You know, if you look at the standard, you can call it pattern recognition, you might call it machine learning, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, you know, those might be flawed. Why? Because the data that you had collected before, all that stuff that you had been collecting, how good would it be to predict future sales? Well, it depends a lot on how habits have changed. And, and that's where I think this idea of kind of just give up and do nothing, absolutely not. I mean, I think what you have to start thinking about is how do I collect those processes? Santiago, I'll come to you. Um, and before coming back to Neil, you know, you've been working with a lot of retailers over time, you know, in your research and so on. Obviously, many of these retailers have data from the past. But some of the retailers you've been working with have also thought carefully about trying out new initiatives. Can you speak a little bit towards what they're trying to test out and how are they learning? What are the kinds of hurdles for some of these companies to, to get that culture of test and learn? Yes, well, thank you. Thank you. I, I think one, one, one topic that to me has been very interesting to discuss over the last few weeks is how uh, retailers are taking this opportunity as, as a way to to, to learn as they as they as the process evolves. In particular, yep. I think that COVID has a, a characteristic that is very valuable for this, that is the wave type of uh, shock. So you uh -huh. have states that close at some point in time, but they're opening early, open with some characteristics. And so if you're a retailer that has hundreds of stores across the US, you might be seeing what reopening looks like in California while you're still in lockdown in New York. And Great point. I think the, the smarter retailers have noticed this, and instead of, to your point, and I think that is a very good one, that historical data and historical trends might not be relevant, but if we think of historical as two-week window, that can be yep. extremely valuable. And and this, I mean, this is a new, not a new concept. Uh, we have been studying how early sales during a season for fashion products are way more predictive than what you can do with your best expertise a year before. And I think yeah. that this, this type of logic and, and, and being proactive in, in, in learning as the wave moves can be extremely valuable. Wonderful. Thank you, Santiago. So what you're suggesting is if I wanted to kind of summarize it, and I think that's a great point is, uh, you know, while pattern recognition, if you're going way back in, in history, may not be great, you know, you can learn from if perhaps you're a national retailer or you have uh, places in different states, so to speak, you might be learning from what's happening in one state in a short period of time and hopefully employ that in another state. Yes, no, absolutely. And I, and I think that that is also true from my conversations when you think about 
online retailers uh -huh. that I think that I think that there was a consensus and, and I think a reality that many of the traditional sales move rapidly to online. And the yeah. question was how sticky this is going to be. Well, yeah. maybe you can start to see how sticky it's going to be because not every state, not every county in, in some cases, is at the same level of reopening and, and activity. And I think yeah. that there is a lot to learn there uh, on how to react in the short term, but also going forward in, in learning about how your different locations and demographic can be affecting the, the back and forth between online and offline. Great point. I think Santiago, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about more about this and, and hear your points too, because one of the things that I'm going to bring up uh, in the next few slides is this idea that to obviously learn as much as possible, you need to have your data not in silos. Hopefully the data can be flowing seamlessly if there is some time and if there's one time in which the data should not be in silos, it's perhaps this time so that you can, in some sense, gain as much traction as possible from different types of data sitting in different places in the company and put it all together. Um, Neil, coming back to you, uh, you know, obviously uh, being at Google, uh, you know, you probably, you know, work, I know that with many different companies, what kinds of problems are they coming to you with uh, without obviously revealing any particular names per se, you know, uh, are these, uh, uh, I can imagine in the audience, there might be people from B2B companies, B2C companies, What's the gamut of things that you're seeing? What are people kind of really anxious about, so to speak, from the decision-making perspective? I mean, there's a long, there's a long list uh, of things people are worried about. I think the two that come to mind is, the first one is that a lot of these companies have been purposeful in developing a data-driven culture. Uh -huh. And now they enter an era where their strategic plans, their dashboards, none of them make a lot of sense. Yep. So companies are looking at it to say, look, sales are down 80%, all the numbers are red. How yep. do we manage a business? What should we focus on? Yep. And almost rebuilding that to say, well, this is the information that we have, and these are the goals and metrics that we can set even during this time of uncertainty. Uh, the second challenge that I'd say that a lot of them are facing is understanding the assumptions by which a lot of their future pandemic strategies are based. And wow. in that sense, I say uh, one of the things, and even looking at some of these questions that are appearing here as we as we have this discussion, is what what's going to happen with these customers once things return to normal? Yeah. And so we see some companies saying, look, our assumption is that this is a short term uh, situation, and therefore a lot of the customers that we acquire for either our delivery services or our, our our online workouts or our streaming video, they're going to be gone as soon as the economy reopens and everyone goes back mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. Another group says this particular group of customers, this represents a new reality. These yeah. people are going to be with us. The previous customers are not going to return with the same behaviors that we previously saw. Mm. And it's not that I'm going to say which approach is right. I think to Santiago's point, we're starting to see that data come up, which is or it's starting to tip the scales to say this might be a little bit more persistent than we initially hypothesized. Yeah. What a lot of companies miss, though, is when they made these assumptions. They yeah. don't go back to revisit to say, well, what did we think when we started this back in March was going to happen? And have we adjusted and changed our models? So to yeah. that larger point that you brought up around experimentation yeah. and testing and learning. Yeah. A lot of them, when sending out these first messages, whether it was about their loyalty program or how they're cleaning their hotels, I didn't witness a lot of companies testing this at all. They wow. just said, look, this is a one-time email. We're going to send this out and that's done. These learnings will be so short term that we don't need to worry about it. Yeah. And, and now they're starting to see, well, wait, these learnings and these interactions may be more persistent. And so they're going back and they're rethinking, well, how should we look at the world? And that'd probably be the largest takeaway that I'd have for the audience with respect to this content is to say, to go back and to say, well, what were some of those assumptions that you made about how the market was behaving? And has new data come in, as we see some of these markets reopen, that would challenge that thinking, that these customers yeah. are going to stay, or this digital transformation will persist, uh, because then your predictions and your tests going forward will be much more precise and much more valuable. Wonderful. No, that's a great point, Neil. And I had a little bit of a follow up. Uh, you know, again, when I think about test and learn, uh, you and I have talked uh, quite a lot about this before. Um, you know, I've done some work on test and learning. And then when you approach companies, of course, it's it's uh, it's hard sometimes because they obviously have some processes looking backwards in that, you know, let's do these models, let's see. And what's the value of test and learn, uh, so to speak? So it takes a lot of time to, in some sense, build this culture of experimentation, testing and learning, you know, proactive data collection, however we want to call it. Now, obviously, 
the current pandemic, the post COVID world, we have to accelerate, so to speak, this culture. Uh, why? Because, you know, some of the points we brought up here, yourself, Santiago, if I were coming to you, imagine I was a company coming to you, uh, Neil, what would be some tangible steps you'll ask me to do? You know, every company can't be Google, every company can't be Microsoft, where there is this culture. If I have to, in some sense, go back and tell uh, my employees, uh, people who I work with, why it's important to now be very proactive. What are some tangible steps that come to your mind? First, first call up. Uh, Google is a company, I'll, I'll say this, in my opinion, we are far from perfect. I think what uh -huh. makes the difference with, with Google and other companies that are successful with experimentation, and they're not restricted to dot-com or tech companies, is yeah. it's a persistent cultural value to test and explore. But it, the, the biggest lesson and takeaway as to how companies do this is it starts at the top. It starts yeah. with leadership empowering uh, other people, and we look specifically at the marketing realm, to take risk. Um, at this time, where we see tightening budgets, we see huge uh, worthwhile concerns about cost uh, and efficiency, marketers in particular have a difficult time saying, well, now I want to go out and take risk. And so we've actually had some companies that, that run experiments and say, look, we will run any experiment as long as there's a 90% chance that it will work. And they get, you know, why are you running the test? And it's because people don't want to look like they're wasting yeah. money. That's the message they've received from their leadership is that testing is risky. We don't want tests to fail. And so you really start doing things that are already known. And so that's the lesson is the leadership empowers people to say, look, what we are about is sorting the situation out, about taking risks, about finding the path forward, about innovating and changing our business. Mm -hmm. Then people at lower levels of the organization feel empowered to take those risks and to make that change. That's where it has to start. Uh, everything else about how you run the experiments and where the money's coming from and the budgets and who's accountable uh, are all secondary to just people feel comfortable that they can explore and try new things in the business. Uh, and, and then be critical about the results and what the learnings are, uh, yeah. positive or negative. Yeah, no, I think they're a great point. Um, I'm just looking at one of the uh, questions. Chandra, uh, do you want to chime in as well? Yeah, so I, I, I would like to add something to, to Neil's point. I think, it's, I think it's a great one. and. I mean, the, the other the other side of this, based on my experience in, in, in running or, or trying to run sometimes uh, tests or experiments with uh, with companies, is that there is this kind of natural inertia to we've been doing things this way, uh, we're we're going to test this to see how it's going, and it's hard to break. And, and I and I understand. I mean, I this is real money from 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 real companies, and I'm only an academic trying to to make things better, but uh, in the abstract. And that has been always a tension because the conversation goes, well, but do you really know that this is working? What is the magnitude that, it... and the answer is, well, it's how we've been doing things and, and, and it, it is hard to break. However, yeah. I think that now there is an opportunity because going back to some of your earlier comments that companies are struggling, the old way to do things is not working right now. I think that maybe some companies can have an opportunity right now to acknowledging that they don't know how to move forward, moving forward in a way that testing is included as part of how you move forward can be an yeah. opportunity. Thank you. Um, I, I want to just bring up some of the, a flavor of some of the questions. Um, I think there are many of them, but just a flavor. And I think it relates directly to this issue of a risk, for example, and Santiago, as you just said, uh, kind of this idea that uh, perhaps, you know, at some point you have to acknowledge that uh, it is going to be hard to be uh, to have perfect accuracy of what's going to happen because things are fundamentally shifted. So some of the questions are very much along the lines of, you know, how can analytics in some sense uh, help in predicting future uncertainty at a time when things are changing and people want certainty? So to me, again, I'll give you my flavor of this answer and I'd love to hear from uh, both, uh, you know, both your ends. You know, my favorite the answer is at some point, I think, you know, the models are only good as good the data is. And at some point, if there has been a seismic shift in terms of how people are behaving, Neil, to your point, um, if, for example, people have fundamentally changed their behavior or perhaps it's a short term, we have to proactively go out there and figure it out. Because I don't think any more data kind of uh, looking at the data historically, again, apart from the two, two week or one week short window is really going to help in that. And so in that sense, being a little bit, uh, I want to call it, uh, I don't want to call it risk seeking, but being able to understand that there is a risk in the sense that things have shifted, but how can we minimize any errors that we're making? We have to proactively figure out what are the top decisions and go out and test it out. 
Neil, I'll come to you. What What are your thoughts on this? I, I think it's exactly that. Um, and the only the only thing I'll add on to it is that, um, as I, as I mentioned before, I think all companies are in the same place. I don't think a company has solved this, which means yeah. that competitively, you just need to be slightly better than what you were doing before. There's yep. not an absolute where some companies have all this data and you're playing catch up and you're behind in the market. It's really a level playing field where everyone really has the same insights, the same questions, which gives some businesses the opportunity to advance if they're able to accelerate and learn faster than their competitors. Indeed, thank you. Uh, Santiago, did you want to add something to that? Yes, no, I I I I, I agree, and I, and I think it is a, it is a, a like I was saying before, I think it's a great opportunity right now for for companies that have been thinking about these issues and trying to become a little bit more uh, in the experimentation uh, business, if you want. I, I think it's a great opportunity. And, and the other the other thing I, I think there is uh, there is here is I, I insist on this idea a big opportunity, right? Because in, 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 in a situation where there is tension and we we are concerned about the cost and all that, that's true. But then, if you succeed and you are and you are able to to put a step forward your competitors, this yeah. is a great a great time. And, and I and I think when you measure your to your point, Raghu, the risk seeking that the, how risk seeking you want to be, you need to consider that okay, there is a downside to this. But it yep. could also be a big upside, and, and I think that balancing that can help more companies to convince themselves that testing, collecting data, and being proactive in this space can can be can be very valuable. Wonderful. Uh, now, before we go forward, I'll just try to summarize it for our audience. I mean, I think uh, one of the big takeaways, as you heard uh, Santiago, Neil, myself chiming in, is I think a understand, try to understand your customer behavior, so to speak. Uh, have things shifted? How have they shifted? And at some point, I think uh, you know, looking at historical data may not be as helpful because if things have fundamentally shifted, uh, in some sense, you know, as this says here, looking at those pattern recognition, so to speak, can be flawed. So think about what might be the best way to generate this culture of experimentation, testing, and learning. As Neil said, I think it has to come from the top. Um, so if you are the C-level leaders in the company, I think you have to embrace that risk and kind of say that you know this is a new way of collecting data about our customers so that we can make more informed decisions. Now moving forward, I think it relates to many of the things that have come up as well. Uh, this idea of, you know, as Santiago mentioned, Neil mentioned as well, you know, uh, this idea that you know you can learn about what's happening in one part of the country, so to speak, in your stores, if you're a physical retailer, uh, even if you're an online retailer, what's happening with opening up uh, of the economy in one state versus another. But much of the value that you might be able to get is because your data is integrated. And what do I mean by that? Uh, it's basically this idea that, and it's, it's, it's not new. It's this idea that you, know, you have to basically be able to seamlessly look at the data from different points of view. It can't be that the data is in silos. I know, uh, you know in some sense for many companies kind of adding more aspects of data is quote unquote easier sometimes than integrating it. But I think if there is a time when, in fact, this integration will reveal and give big rewards, I think this is the time now. Because if you want to do the test and learn, if you want to learn from other countries, other states, whatever it is, if you're an international retailer, you need to be able to seamlessly look at this data. So let's talk about this idea of data integration. And I think, you know, uh, there are a couple of points here which we've talked about, you know, the robust perspective of the market, which is I just mentioned from a from an operations perspective, perhaps it's critical to have this uh, this data silos, so to speak, taken away from an efficiency one. But I think we want to focus uh, collectively, uh, the three of us here to think about kind of what changes are coming. Um, especially in the post-COVID world, especially with uh, the California Act coming along. I know there are some questions about privacy as well and, and behavior. Um, so yeah, I want to sh shift a little bit of our focus towards that to talk about why rather than just the data silos going away, being nice to have, it's now become business critical. And to do that, I think, uh, you know, just to give you a sense of what the California Privacy Act is, I won't read it out, you can see it. Uh, just for those of us who may not be as familiar with it, uh, it's uh, it's going to be starting to be, in some sense, uh, in practice, penalties being given to companies uh, starting July. Uh, so many companies are under this. And in fact, uh, what's happening also is, um, and these laws are rapidly evolving, uh, what's also happening is that this is not just for companies in California. 
any company that might be operating from another state but is is in any of these three buckets so to speak has data from uh, consumers in california may also be under that same law but i think just to put it in a more tangible way i think neil you had a very nice example of what happened to you when you had got to a hotel chain do you want to just talk a little bit about this example i can move the slide forward yeah and let's, let's let's go to this and and the reason i do this is because let's let's be honest when we start talking about things like privacy and regulation they're boring. Uh, they're even, and I, I live in the space, and I, I find them boring. And, and Raghu, you and I have exchanged like all the regulatory yeah. notes that are coming out from the state of California, and they're boring to read. Um, yeah. So here's here's what happened. Just in, in, with this context of being boring, is because I have two kids, I don't do a lot on New Year's. This law went into effect on January 1st of this year. So what I decided to do was I decided just to submit a, a bunch of requests for my personal data uh, yeah. because I was curious. I said, what does that look like? And Raghu, you have this one slide up here. This is, I think this is, uh, this is a large retail. I want to say it's Target. Uh, just yeah. what they sent back for me. It says, this is how we look at you as a customer. And it was fascinating just from the consumer side. But what I was also curious about, which started to become evident, was just process difficulties companies had. Uh -huh. And so when you mentioned about the nice to have with a lot of the companies we've spoken to, there has been uh, for the past decade, a, st a steady drumbeat of how great it will be if we can bring all of our customer data together, these yep. 10, 20, and sometimes 70 different systems, if we can see all this data integrated into one place. Yep. And the response from finance has been, yeah, that's a great project, but we have lots of projects like this where we can improve efficiency. We don't want to do it. And now what the California Consumer Privacy Act does is it imposes a cost on businesses uh, if they can't pull this information quickly. So on January 1st, I submitted 150 of these requests and I just watched them come back. And, and this this one that you have on the next slide is actually the the, the most fascinating one. Right, go, go one more. We're going to skip this one. Okay. Um, this one right here was that uh, I actually received this note back from an individual hotel chain I stayed at more than five years ago. And this wonderful yeah. woman writes out to me and she said, what do you see here? She said, can I get, can I ask you what what are you trying to get out with this California privacy request? And I wrote back and I told her honestly, I, I was just curious to see what happens. But since we're yeah. talking, uh, and you have this data request, what do you have to do? Yeah. And she said, well, I have to go to the warehouse and I have to pull your paperwork. I have to scan it, and then I have to send it back to you. And I said, but this is one hotel I've, I've stayed at, wow. uh, at dozens, if not 100 hotels. What are they doing? And she's like, well, our systems, Raghu, to your point, aren't integrated. I, ha I imagine every hotel is going to do that as well. Mm. And what I received in return was an 117-page document uh, that came in, in many forms, functions, definitely unstructured data. But you can see that a lot of time was put in just satisfying this single request. And as a California consumer, I'm allowed to ask companies for this every six months. And to think that someone has to go through, and, and this introduces, this imposes a yeah. lot of costs. So we start to see system integration moving from this nice to have, imagine what we could do as an organization, to what happens if we have 1,000, 5,000, or 10,000 of these requests a year? Yeah, uh, and we think about 20% of businesses are already above that 5,000 threshold, where yeah. it will take them hours to go through these individual systems simply to comply with the regulations that are in place, simply to be able to provide consumers with the information they have. Yeah. And so what's happening now is companies are starting to shift to say, look, if we have these costs that we know we're going to incur with manual analyst time of having this this woman have to go to the warehouse and pull this. This is now a business case for fully transforming and integrating our systems together. So we get to reap all the benefits of efficiency and automation yep. and being able to build these robust profiles of our customers, and while at the same time justifying it to say that otherwise we're gonna incur these costs as a business. Yep. Uh, we're gonna see this be people like this that will have to reach out to individual consumers to understand their request and then pull this information. And even on the far side, we didn't include screenshots for this. Uh, there was one retailer that sent me 35,000 transactions from other customers. Oh boy. Okay. Right, we didn't put a screenshot of this up for obvious reasons. And I contacted the business, I contacted the general counsel afterwards, and I, I handed back the data. I said, just to let you know this happened, could you tell me why? 
And they came back and they said, oh, yeah, it was just we 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 had a, a mess up in the SQL query that we wrote. We just pulled too much data and someone didn't validate it. Again, a weakness of just having these manual processes. Yeah. The large takeaway here is companies are seeing more integrated data. They've always pushed for this, but now that privacy regulation is saying you will incur costs on July 1st. Even with the pandemic, California Attorney General said the financial yeah. penalties are in effect. Uh, and this is leading to businesses of what exactly uh, you have up here right now, Raghu. Yeah, so exactly. No, I think that perfect uh, pitch, I think, uh, Neil. Thank you for uh, talking about your personal story. I know we've talked about this before, but I think it's very helpful for the audience also to hear in the following sense. I think, uh, you know, we talk, we, you know, many, many companies perhaps have been talking about this idea that they should, in some sense, remove the silos get a customer centric view, understand why they're collecting data. But I think, you know, if you think about this, I think in the COVID world, post COVID world, for a variety of reasons, be it regulation that we just talked about in terms of uh, carefree understanding what consumer privacy is going to be like, be it, for example, in terms of getting more efficiency, be it, for example, what uh, Santiago brought up, which is, you know, if you are a retailer, perhaps, or a hotel chain, whatever the case might be spread across the US and you want to learn but what's happening in other parts of the US and integrated for other parts. How do you do that? You have to have, in some sense, audits of data ownership. You have to understand, for example, how to, in some sense, remove those silos and bring them together such that you can transfer that learning. And so I think the big takeaway, I think, from Neil's perspective and, and our perspective is, I think you should treat this as an opportunity. How can we make sure that all those things that we wanted to do before can be accelerated in terms of having one single view of the customer, such that if it's regulation, such that it's efficiency, such that if it's better prediction, we can all put it together. So just to give you a sense, why is it important? I just laid out there. Uh, I'm looking at the time and we also want to get to the supply chain one. I think just to give it laid out there, a uh, little emphasis is added. Uh, again, this is from the, uh, the California Attorney General, if I remember correctly. Uh, as, as the office is stating, they understand that this is a, a, a big problem right now in terms of COVID-19, in terms of getting all this data. But you can imagine as companies are opening up, e-commerce, there's a lot more data. There's a lot of personal identifiable information. Just the example that Neil brought up. On the other hand, if you are a physical kind of uh, uh, you know, retailer, opening up the malls, opening up office space, you're tracking perhaps a lot of uh, data because of regulation. You want to make sure that people are healthy. At the same time, how this data is collected. Consumers may want this data. So one has to be very, very careful A, where this data is being collected, perhaps thinking about people who are involved in data governance uh, and make sure in some sense that you are mindful in terms of what data you're collecting and how you're using it and where it's stored. Neil, uh, Santiago, if you don't mind chiming in for that point before we move to supply chains, that'd be great. Uh, Santiago, I'll start with you and then I'll go to Neil. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I thought that uh, I mean this is this this I mean it's a little bit uh, a, a, a parallel word to to I mean also to make the transition if you want to to the supply chain issue but yeah. this learning and understanding about your customer I mean this is a classical uh, uh, question of how are you mapping your supply chain I mean yeah. do you know who is uh, providing you your raw materials who is your uh, who, who is uh, upstream from your from your business? Who is downstream from your business? And and I think that in, in the context of end customers and and privacy uh, laws, that 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 is maybe a, a, a new issue. But for very big businesses that are, are running this constantly, understanding and learning and learning how to share the information, yeah. which in this type of of context where things are shifting, you really need to know who are your suppliers who are you, you supplying to that you might be the critical uh, the critical partner for that customer that you have had for many years and maybe you don't know i think having this information uh, readily available and in a reliable uh, fashion i think is, is is critical as ever right great thank you neil i know we've talked a lot about you know we don't want to um, on the one hand obviously this issue of privacy makes uh, a lot of companies and firms as understandably a little bit uh, paranoid about what to do. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, this, I, I, as, as we've talked about it, it's an opportunity to now understand how to quote unquote integrate your data, but in a way that's regulatory compliance as well. Any any kind of uh, big picture takeaways for the audience here? 
I mean, the, the largest th thing behind it is that this is motivating companies to look at what they're capturing and how that data is connected. So does, I love that Santiago's positioning is very much like on yeah. supply chains to say customers are one of your most, if not the most valuable resource that you have. The data uh -huh. that you're collecting, how you understand them uh, is different across uh, across different silos, different groups, different platforms. Uh, regulation is typically that, oh, we're going to lose our data. Instead, what it's doing is it's forcing the conversation for companies to come to the table and say, what are you really collecting? And for yep. most companies, when they go through these types of audits, they're surprised at the data that they have. And as well to when you talk about anonymization and, and, and PII, they're actually surprised at times the, the data that they're using. And yep. they find out that even though they're capturing a whole bunch of data, it's generally this resource that in the future they say they're going to use and, and somehow commercialize. And now it's forcing those conversations to say, is there value? Should we be capturing this? Because now we need to share this with consumers and say we have it. Wonderful. Thank you, Neil. Uh, thank you, Santiago, as well. I think this is a perfect segue, um, as Santiago also mentioned, uh, in terms of understanding the supply chain part of it, which is uh, our last uh, topic that we want to bring up uh, in the time that we have, which is, you know, obviously a very big issue nowadays is thinking about supply chain resilience. All the people in the audience uh, obviously must be quite aware of the stories that we've heard about how supply chains broke down during the COVID world. Uh, things are backing up a little bit now in terms of, or back up a little bit in terms of making them resilient. But if you think about some of these success stories, there are many of them. Uh, you know, there are lots and lots of companies, bigger ones typically, when we think about supply chains, uh, looking at blockchains, location intelligence, you've got Walmart, Honeywell, and all of these things. But Satyago, I'll turn to you, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, if I'm uh, somebody in the audience who's not a Walmart, who's not a Honeywell, how should I think about this? I know uh, we can start off by thinking about uh, some of these issues, but I would love to hear from you, especially for the audience in terms of if I'm, a, if I'm a company that doesn't have that expertise of the blockchain and so on, how should I go about this? Yeah, so I, I think that uh, the, the way I, I see the problem is, first, what can you do right now? Because... Yeah. I, uh, I mean, as, as, as an academic, we might have the tendency to start explaining what you should have done, but yes. it's not very helpful right now. So yeah. I, I think I, I think uh, one important focus should be in in forecasting, and yeah. with some of the things we discussed before, being aware that maybe when you think about using historical data, you might be thinking in terms of two things: mm -hmm. shorter horizons, so try to use data yeah. that is for the last two weeks and also geographic, ge geographically dispersed. So you might yeah. want to take advantage of how the shock is affecting Europe right now, where restaurants and bars are already open, people are, out, are, are outside. Well, that is not happening in the US. Someone can argue, well, this is not perfect. I was looking at some of the questions. Can you use the data from Asia or Europe to, the, to, to look at the yeah. US? And clearly, well, this is not perfect. This is not what you will do uh, if, if you have perfect data from your yeah. home country, but right now that might be a, a very good uh, data source to to look how you can forecast going forward. Yeah. I yeah. think that the other the other opportunity that you can have right now is to try to simplify the problem, mm -hmm. in, in the sense that maybe if you think of the assortment and the variety of product that you manufacture or or, or you carry as a yeah. retailer. Maybe yeah. right now, one way to make the problem easier is to be aware that your customer might be very uh, sensitive to a certain set of products or a certain flavors or assortment in your product, but not others. And so you can ignore that for the time being to make sure that you have uh, the, the availability of, of those products. And I think that it is also true when you think about you as the supplier to, to someone down the chain, right? Because you might want to be aware of what is the impact of you making that decision down the down the supply chain. Wonderful. Um, no, I think again, just to summarize, uh, uh, start simple, perhaps, uh, just to understand, you know, what are the the critical ones? What are the ones, in some sense, which are the 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 uh, the, the what you call it, kind of like the ones that can kind of uh, tilt the the whole thing towards one side or the other side. Uh, try to figure out which are the ones which are pivotal uh, and then go ahead and try to make other decisions. I know we wanted to talk a little bit about digital supply chains. Um, I'd be great again uh, from your perspective, Santiago, and also Neil, from your perspective as well, because of course you're seeing a lot of digital data. It would be great to hear in some sense, you know, what might 
some of the companies who have become more digital or are more digital savvy already, um, how can they learn from the data that they have? Santiago, I'll start with you. Yes, well, I, I think that some of the points we, we already touched during the conversation, yeah. because like, like we discussed, I mean, this is, I mean, this is a, a topic when you think about the supply chain that is not something completely unconnected or unrelated to what happened with the end customer. And I think that companies that are suffering the most right now are the ones that they don't have the information readily available. And yeah. if they want to start thinking about how to react, the speed that they that they can react to is extremely small. I mean, we can think back to the Neil example of someone going back to 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 the hotel room uh, making copies of of, of stand papers and whatnot. I mean, that, that is clearly not an effective way. And, well, the same thing can happen if you think about your supply chain information. Yeah. You, you you need to have these organized in in a way that will be uh, possible for you to react. In, in a speedy manner, and right now yeah. we can see that the, the value of that. One one important thing to to, to remember is that I, I hope that this is an opportunity to to see the value of this so going forward for supply chain managers that maybe and I hope not we, we don't see many of these global shocks. But mm. through the years, supply chain managers have seen plenty of these shocks that come again and again, and we can think of the tsunamis. The, the volcano in Iceland, and if you're a supply chain manager, you are not uh, you, you're, you're not new to these shocks. I think that the yeah. magnitude and the characteristic of this one is really unique. Yeah. But I hope that this can be uh, similar to what we were discussing in, in terms of testing and, and, and experimentation, seeing the value of having the digital information that your supply chain needs to run properly, uh, readily available. I think that this this can be an opportunity there. Great, thank you. Um, Neil, from your perspective, uh, you know, uh, I think it would be great for our audience to have, you know, if you had to, and, and I know you do, regularly talking to companies who want to kind of say, well, what do we do now? What's, what, I know there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of things, and we talked about this test and learn. Are there other things that they should be thinking about as we kind of try to wrap up this session? What are some of the things that would be great for, for our audience to kind of take away and say, Here's what I'd like to tell my employees, my analytics team. Here's what we should start doing. I wish I had a magic bullet for it, but, yeah. you know, we talked about a lot of things. Testing and learning, being able to encourage them to take risk are all going to be things that will pay dividends, especially in the short term. I'd say the yeah. other thing is be purposeful about closing the gap between where the data comes from and where the decisions are made. Uh, yeah. When we witness organizations, we see that there's usually just five, six, oh. ten levels as that raw data, that insight, goes through and is translated and layered into existing strategies and politics that yeah. slows down reaction time. It forces data into existing narratives. Get those people together in the room and just say, look, I want to know what the raw data, the hypotheses, no matter how silly they are, I want to see that before all, everyone starts translating what the business should do next. Uh, exactly. That allows people to see what's actually happening on the ground. We tend to look at that as being a lot better than people saying, here's the action we should take. So it's almost making sure that it becomes data-driven decision-making instead of internally data-driven selling, where people know what direction they have, and by the time it gets to decision-makers, that, that data has already been called down to where it's, this is what we should absolutely do. So being a little bit curious, embracing that uncertainty, I think will pay off for most companies. Great. Uh, thank you. I, I'm looking at the time. I think we're almost up to the 45-minute mark. Um, I think with that, we will try to end by just saying, again, thank you, Santiago. Thank you, Neil. On my end, I think uh, just to reiterate some of the things that we talked about, one is, I think, embrace risk and uncertainty. I wish uh, any of us here could, as, as Neil said, give you the magic bullet, so to speak. Uh, I think it's hard. Uh, you have to be able to embrace that risk. And how do we go ahead and collect data? It is by testing and learning. And then go ahead and kind of try to have this uh, understanding of where the data resides, what is it doing, what is the purpose, and from a supply chain perspective, I think the questions are no different. Understanding where the things are, where is it hurting the most, learning from that, I think that's where the value is. So I will stop here. Thank you again, Neil and Santiago, for joining me. I will turn it over to Wendy. Thank you, Raghu, Santiago, and Neil for your highly engaged, informative session. And thank you to everyone who joined us today for your questions, insights, and thoughts. A presentation recording will be made available 24 to 48 hours after this program ends. And as mentioned, if you're looking to continue this discussion in more depth, 
with the opportunity to hear from Wharton supply chain thought leaders, the Wharton Live Virtual Designing and Managing Supply Chains for the Future program will kick off August 3rd through August 7th. To learn more about this, please visit WhartonExecutiveLive.com for more details. And for information about Raghu's academic director and leader of our customer analytics for growth using machine learning, AI, and big data program, and to learn about WCA, you can find this information on the program slide deck we will be sharing with you. Finally, please join us again for another Wharton Livecast, Tuesday, June 23rd, with Professor Jerry Wind, who will be discussing creating opportunities in a time of crisis. Thank you again, and please stay safe, and we do hope that we will all see you on campus at Wharton very soon.